Divine Truth Spirit Interaction Jesus, Mary and others interact with people who have lived on earth and who have now passed into the spirit world. In this recording, titled Natalia Asks About God, the Soul and the Environment, Mary channels Natalia and a group of spirits who are following God's way and very interested in the environment on earth and in the spirit world who ask Jesus to talk about God's creation of the environment, human influences upon an environment, and how an environment benefits the experiences of the human. Recorded on the 19th of December, 2018, from 12.30pm, in Wilkesdale, Queensland, Australia. Session 1. Good morning, good afternoon and good evening. (laughs) Uh, It's good to see you guys again, uh, even though it's through the lens of this camera. (laughs) Mary and I are here again today. We we did just earlier, we did one channeling session. We're going to do another one now. So welcome again, darling, to do that. Um, This one, uh, what Mary and I find is that there are a lot of spirit uh, groups around us who are quite polite uh, with us and not very pushy, but they would like to speak with us about specific subjects. But frequently, because they're not that pushy, they don't get to speak with us. And so what we're trying to do now is give more of those kind of spirits an opportunity to speak, because frequently they're looking for some truth about some subject. And uh, so that's what we're going to do today, a bit of a discussion with some who have been politely waiting, (laughs) and patiently probably is the best way of putting it, waiting for us to want to have a conversation with them. And they specifically would like to talk about the playground, I suppose we could call it, that God's created and why God created the playground for us to live in, in terms of what that teaches us. So as far as we're aware, that's what the topic is at this point. So we'll see how we go with the conversation and find out a bit more about them as we go. Hello. G'day, how are you? Very well, thank you for having us. Yeah, thank thanks. you. <laughs> <laughs> thanks for your patience. <laughs> There's other spirits pop in occasionally and muck up our time tabling. <laughs> yes, but we have a lot to observe and we learn a lot by watching. So. Of course, yeah. yeah. So what, what, what's your name? My name is Natalia. Natalia. And I, I was French when yes. I was on Earth. And I lived in the 17th century in a small village in France. And I, I enjoyed my life. Um, I was very connected with nature when I was on earth. I was very fascinated by herbal remedies. And, um, I used to treat the people in, in our village, uh, with herbal remedies. And I just loved being in nature and being outside and, and spending time with what God had created. I had some belief in God, though not well developed. Uh, And so, yes, so I enjoyed that very much. And now I'm here with a group who basically, we all have very similar questions and and, uh, some of them are these. Can before we proceed with your questions, could I just ask you a question, another question about, just to give some history. Yes. so um, are the entire group uh, been around in the spirit world for a while or, or is it a mixture right, right the way up to recent? Yes, it's a mixture. All right, it's all right. a mixture. And also, um, where do you live now as a group? Like We're in the third sphere. Third sphere of the spirit world. And have you developed your relationship with God or have you? Yes, yes. yes. So I was getting to that, yes. No so, um, uh, well, yes, I mean... I would call myself an avid follower of the way yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I'm very grateful to yourself because I have learnt a great deal from you. So when did you come like against the material or, or the information about God's way? How long ago was that? Oh, quite a while ago. Yes. Well, not so long in comparison, but yeah. um, seven years, seven, seven years, years yeah. yes. So relatively yeah. recently compared to the fact that you, and so for 300 yes. years you obviously yes. spent uh, a, a, a your progress in that time was you found it like on the what we'd be calling here the natural love path, but obviously it's just well, I, through yeah. natural development. 
Uh, in some way, but not completely. Yeah. I, I don't... I feel um, that really I was developing in God's way, but very, very unwittingly and yes. slowly. Yes. I had no yes. idea really what I was doing. Yeah. I had a feeling in my heart for God. There's no question. And on earth I had that, and then when I passed also. And I believe that that feeling, uh, what I understand now, assisted me greatly when yeah. I passed. Yeah. But yeah. I had not really yet developed a lot of the desires that I that I now have, uh, which have caused a change, quite a change in me in the in the um, in the last little while. So could could we say you're now consciously engaging your desire? Yes. Whereas before it was more sort of unconscious and very uneducated, and I realised that I didn't really. Um, well, I didn't really ask enough questions. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a, that's the feeling I had from your previous portion of that development. <laughs> yes, yes. Not enough questions. <laughs> Not enough questions. Uh, I yeah. understand a lot more now about questions and desire. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, it's so, great, isn't it? Yeah, it's great. Yeah. Questions open up a whole new world of everything, don't they? <laughs> yes. Like, yes. Yeah. But I really feel I lived quite a simple life on Earth, and I was quite. Um, connected to the idea that there was a creator, God, and, and I had some Christian background. And was it a Catholic Christian background? or Yes. Uh, well, I guess that's what you would call it, yes. Yes. Yeah. Not so... Um, Rigid as what? Yes, the... it didn't resemble... No, it doesn't resemble perhaps pure Catholicism um, as you would understand it. But like yes. it was in the cities, like in the that, you lived right. in the countryside, and exactly the uh, religious uh, power to powers to be weren't that interested necessarily in the no, people of the countryside. There was less uh, pomp and grandeur, I mm, suppose. Mm, we mm. we had a simple chapel in the town, and that's where we went together. Most of the village went together, and there wasn't too much um, doctrine, I suppose you would call it. Doctrine uh, and ceremony. Yes, <laughs> yes. And so I, I feel blessed for that because I, yeah. uh, the simplicity that I saw in nature, I feel that I was able to transpose or take into that faith and that helped me a lot. And, and also I suppose I began to develop many of the ideas that I wish to ask you about today mm -hmm. while I was on earth. My problem when on earth as as was the case until I, till I heard you speak on earth just recently um, in the last seven years, was that I, that I um, in many ways, I preferred the simplistic view. I felt it helped me feel peaceful about things. Uh, and I, I felt, so while there was, truth in what I what I now see is while there was truth in what I believed and that I did have a feeling in my heart for God it wasn't I wasn't uh, I was quite comfortable in in this set of beliefs that I had and I I saw God in nature and um, so were you, were you comfortable so I, with your sort of a, a in some ways it sounds to me a little bit of desired ignorance almost is well, that that's, was, I suppose that's what I'm getting at. Yeah. I, I felt a comfort about it and I didn't really uh, challenge myself or my life when I was on earth. Yeah. I, I was happy to be as I was and I felt uh, in, indeed I didn't engage a, a marriage uh, yeah. when I was on earth and I felt very happy being alone. I felt uh, fulfilled by my relationship with nature and what I perceived God to be at that time. So it was almost a, a nun-like existence, uh, one of service to my community, and I felt very uh, fulfilled by that. And, and that continued when I entered the spirit life. Uh, I now see that there were some reasons why I liked that simplicity and didn't wish to expand my questioning, if mm. you will. Uh, beyond what it was, hmm. because I felt a level of comfort that I have had to challenge since listening to you speak. 
Okay, so so that's a good background for yourself and the uh, and the others who are with you, Natalia. Okay, so and so if I could speak about the yeah, group just as a whole. just a short and our main purpose. There's a there's a great number of us by now. Mm-hmm. <laughs> We've been gathering people as time goes on, and um, all of us share a common um, a common passion for nature and the earth, and um, what we experienced in nature, the environment on yeah. Earth. And yeah. so um, we are 10,000 of us, really, if I really calculated, although this waxes and wanes because a lot of us have many other interests also. Of course. We've just yeah. come together today because we wished specifically to hear from you about this topic. And so I, everyone has come together and we feel quite marvellous and there's quite a bit of, um, uh, yes, desire but also excitement. <laughs> And so we're here together, we all share in common this desire to understand really the significance of the natural world on earth and what um, really all of us felt that our faith in God and our relationship with God commenced with our fascination or our connection, love connection with the natural world Mm -hmm. and the environment. Mm -hmm. And that really having that opening and that connection opened us really to to a uh, love-based feeling for God for having created such a thing. And the wonder and fascination we saw or that we felt for this world also helped us to open up to the concept that um, God, someone was caring for this environment, someone mm-hmm. had created it and mm-hmm. someone was loving it. Uh, and so we share that in common and... So we we would like to understand specifically now that we are in the spirit life, is there more in terms of our study of the earth-based environment and really what we experienced in nature and in the natural world in our life on earth, is there more it can continue to teach us now? Many of us are quite engaged in exploration of the environment around us now in our new environment. But there is still some uh, interest and inkling that perhaps what God created when we first incarnated on the earth, perhaps that was particularly special in some way. And perhaps there is more that we, things that we missed or more that we could learn or even um, more that we can learn about um, our environment here by understanding more about that environment. Mm. Or, yeah. well, now the list is endless. What is the purpose of an environment? And, and yeah. all of those things. So, But I think that is the... If you would be willing to um, <laughs> grace us with that answer, we, we would be so excited. Sure. And <laughs> um, firstly, probably what it'd be good to talk about is the purpose of the environment. Okay. Now, here we have to sort of separate the purpose into two pathways, I suppose, would be best to separate the purpose. Because before humankind, uh, before the first human soul incarnated into an environment that they were conscious of, the environment itself had to have been prepared. Mm. Mm-hmm. And uh, this is interesting in itself, really, if you think about it, as to what that tells us about God and also what that tells us about why God wanted the environment prepared before humanity entered the environment. Because there's obviously some interesting things there that we can discuss about those two questions. Why did God create the environment before he created the process of incarnation to go into the environment mm. and and secondly why did god um establish this this pristine environment before humans entered that environment there's got to be reasons like that, that things that it tells us about god's nature yes and um another element that fascinates some of us about that yeah. is um if so it's in some ways it feels somewhat obvious to some of us that there needed to be an environment to to really accommodate each of us. But many of us have pondered the question, if humans didn't incarnate, uh, what would God have created the environment? And um, 
what would it be like without humans in the environment? Well, what I'm suggesting basically is that there was a time when the environment existed without humans in the environment. Now, obviously... Yes, and what was that like? And, yeah, yes, and, and obviously no human was present to get the pictures of what that was like. So the only person, the only source of that material is God himself, isn't it? But if we look at the purpose of just some basic things that it tells us about God first, and then we'll look at the environment itself. But to my mind, preparing an environment uh, as a pristine environment before humanity enters the environment, there's a, there's a number of very good reasons for that. And, and the very first good reason that, that I feel is there is that is that then humanity, humanity can use the environment to measure their effect on the environment. If, if, if the environment was just created as just a necessity for living without it being pristine, then when humans enter the environment, humans would not have easily understood the relationship between the soul condition of the human and the environment. Mm -hmm. But when the environment is pristine before the human comes, now when the human comes to that environment, he's able to in measure his impact mm -hmm. upon the environment. So that, to my mind, that's one of the reasons why God created the environment in a pristine state. So I, I you know, I, I feel quite clear about that from what, you know, what, from what uh, interactions I've had with God about that subject, that God didn't create uh, an environment. Um, sorry, God took many millions of years to create the environment, but he didn't create the environment and go, right, well, it's now in year two million and, and we've now just got some, some crustaceans around the place and, 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 you know, we've got some water and at least we've got some, a few little trees here and there and, and we've got potatoes or, you know, some one source of food. So now let's put humans in that environment and see how they go. Mm -hmm. But rather God allowed the process of his love influencing the evolutionary process through to the stage where before the humanity arrived on the environment, the environment itself was in such a pristine condition mm -hmm. that it had the ability to now reflect to the human, the human's either development or de degradation into the environment. It's exquisite, isn't it? Yes. The environment. And yes, I see what you're saying there. And so today it's interesting when I talk to people about the environment, because as you know, I'm quite passionate about the environment. And when we have discussions with people about the environment, one of the first things people do as a common, as a common thing that they do is they assume that the current environment is how things always have been. Mm -hmm. And this is the problem associated with a short lifespan on Earth, isn't it? Like where you have a short lifespan on Earth, so you enter Earth, you see your environment, and particularly at your, in your day in the 1700s, man had less of an ability to negatively affect the environment as they do today. You know, there's less machinery and, you know, less equipment and so forth. And so, so you enter the environment and over the course of your life, while you did notice things get chopped down and things changed and all those kind of things, things got built and there was destruction of the environment, it was a much more slower process. And so by the time you passed, you could see the destruction occurring, but it's very, very slow in comparison to what we see today. Many of us are deeply, deeply concerned about what has happened since the age of industrial revolution. And yeah. And many of us feel uh, almost at times distraught about what we know is possible and what we lived on Earth in terms of the environment and yes. now as it is. And you, and you see some locations in the world, and you, I'm thinking now about sort of almost the entire of the Middle East where there's been the high populations for long periods of time. And now you see the same kind of thing in Europe and and in other parts of the world now where hu higher human populations have, uh, have arrived, you basically see a, a, that in itself has a large impact on the environment. But then there's also this mechanisation, as you say, the industrialization of humanity that's had a very large negative effect on the environment as well, to such a point that there's certain environments now on the earth that can't sustain much life or, or at all, hardly. I know, it's we a, see it. 
we see it. But we also see, I mean, the uh, resiliency of what God has created. It's remarkable. Uh, yeah. At times we think it cannot survive anymore. And, and it can. And yet it does. Yeah. And, and we, uh, there's many things we wish to ask you about. For us, it is impossible for us to think that of of having such a disconnection from the natural world and yet so many people now on earth seem to have such a disconnection from the natural world how what is the cause of that well i i feel that's a, a sort of another subject in itself isn't it yes, a lot of it's sort of i like, could ask you many, <clears throat> many questions yeah if we just focus first a bit more on the first part of the subject because this interaction, like God creating a pristine environment and allowing the human to impact the environment through the actions of the human and, and the soul condition of the human, ha, 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 is, a, is a pretty deep expression of God's love in the sense that being able to demonstrate to a human who is not connected with God that, that there are certain things about their own life that that are destroying if they destroy the environment. And even people who have no connection with God whatsoever can, can at least connect with the environment and go, right, I can see the degradation of this environment. I can see that my actions are the thing that's impacting the environment. And therefore, I can see that I must change my actions if I'm going to change the impact that I have on the environment. So immensely yeah. beautiful, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Yeah. And just many of us now feel again how even the environment in its pristine state opened us to God and what a gift that was yes. also. And even if you examine all of these, you know, like you said, uh, the environment today is struggling to survive. But even with the struggle to survive, it's remarkable how much does survive, yes. given the terrible amount of uh, destructive and negative impact humanity is now having on the environment. It's remarkable how much still survives. And, and that is all about how I feel that that teaches us a lot of lessons about God too, that, that God is always attempting to help the human understand that from God's perspective, the survival of the environment and the human is a very important part of God's design. That 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 we that it's very very difficult for us to go to the point of total annihilation of anything. And it's interesting when you look at environment, particularly over the last hundred years, where there's been radioactive environments established and stuff like that through human through the human condition, and and seeing how much the nature itself is able to cope with. Mm -hmm. those particular things, even if humans cannot. So, so there are places now out there on Earth where, where they're highly radioactive. The, na the natural environment itself is surviving and actually starting to flourish, even yes. though there are these terribly high doses of radiation in the animals and creatures themselves. And is that, a, that appears to us to be a part of God's process of rehabilitation. Correct. Is that true? Yeah, keep the people out, <laughs> basically, yeah. and the and environment let the will other recover. Natural world do the do the repair, basically. Exactly, but the the other thing that's interesting too is that more than a that a natural environment is connected to the human, the more uh, it cannot cope with uh, large fluctuations in the environment stability. So, so what I mean by that is that if we have domesticated animals and we put them in an environment that is, say, highly dosed with radiation, what we see is that domestic animals have problems with mutation and other, other issues that the natural environment does not have. Mm -hmm. So this should help mankind also see that there's something in the human that causes the human to respond mm -hmm. to external things, so even such as radiation that also influences its environment yes. that is immediately connected to it. So this gives, um, the environment is God's way really to show mankind the principles of cause and effect. Mm. It's, a, it's a primary way of demonstrating the law of cause and effect. And without the environment, the law of cause and effect would be very, very difficult to actually measure. 
um, because you'd have to measure it based on relationship only and not on anything that's going on in the environment. So what we see happening today, of course, is that humankind is, is very disconnected from the environment. And in some ways, in, in certain areas, that can help the environment. And in other areas where humans are, uh, like there's a difference between being disconnected from the environment and having a negative impact on the environment. So, oh, so, so what yes, I mean by that yes, is in, in many cities, for example, uh, people are very disconnected from the environment because they don't have much of the environment around them. They can't see much of the natural world that is living around them. And they don't have a heart feeling for it. That's for it. what we were That's referring right. to. Yes. But that causes them to not want to go in, in, incur into, if you like, ha have incursions into in, in pristine environments because they're not interested in it. And that's actually protecting those pristine environments from further destruction. But their yeah. lifestyle seems to very negatively impact pristine this, environment. Exactly. So uh, the other problem is, is that there is the choices that those particular people now make because of their disconnection with the environment, not understanding the impact that it's having on the environment in other locations. Mm -hmm. And you, as you know, when you look through parts of China, for example, and yes. parts of other countries, it, some of the environments are becoming so destroyed now because of industrialization and this never ending consumption. That the selfishness, and the, the selfishness. Exactly, yeah. yeah. And also not only the selfishness, but also the lack of desire to recover it. Because as you know now, the mm -hmm. further it degrades, the more difficult it becomes to recover. Yeah. And so, you know, that, that is also having an impact. But, but still all those things should tell the human that, there are, that the environment is a, is, a, is a necessary part of their life. And unless they start caring for it, that human life on Earth is going to become very, very difficult very, very quickly now, mm. uh, unless we start really caring for it. And, and we've got to learn how to care for it. And we've got to make different choices. And we've got to stop making choices based on comfort and make, start making choices based on reality. Mm. Because, it, because a lot of our comfort-based choices are having a severe impact upon the environment itself. So, so the first point, part of the the discussion, I feel, needs to surround the fact that God created this pristine environment and he created it primarily like the pristine environment before humans entered was created as a pristine environment. It, it was allowed to be established into a pristine state before humans entered it because that then would allow the human the maximum amount of chance to measure his <laughs> impact upon the environment. And, wow. and that's a wonderful thing. But also it gave the, the environment itself a chance to develop its most diversity at that point. So what happened was that humankind wasn't injected, if you like, into the natural world and until there was the largest amount of diversity possible created through the evolutionary process and the injection of God's new creations into that process. And that was again, for a purpose of creating the basis for the most amount of variety possible so that should humanity degrade the environment after that point, locked up in the genetic code that exists all through, you know, the natural environment, locked up in that genetic code is the potential for the original pristine environment to be recovered. And... If, if God didn't do that and only created like, you know, five different types of food and 10 different types of trees and, you know, and so forth, and then put humans into it, because of humans' choices to, and particularly their choices to discard God's feelings about matters and discard the environment, they would have probably, even if they had a love for the environment, they probably, you know, like a, a respect, I should say, of the environment, they probably would have impacted through their choices so much that even the 10 or so things they had would have been eventually degraded. So by that, do you mean because there is diversity, then uh, even when a, an environment degrades somewhat, there is still something, some species that can adapt to the new condition rather than just having a very limited parameter for what can exist when? Well, because there's not only species that adapt to the new condition. 
There's also species that or go suited to the new condition. There's also species that go into what we would classify as a hibernating condition or a potential condition, mm-hmm. isn't there? Like if you look at uh, most insects, for example, they do this for long periods of time, yes. and 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 can do it in some, in, in fact, can do it for thousands of years under certain circumstances. So and tens of thousands of years under certain circumstances. So the the beauty of that is that the potential is there in the genetic code. It's been locked up somewhere, whether that is in terms of the ability to, for it to, to, to um, cope with the uh, changes of the environment, which naturally every creature has. But there's also these other ones that, uh, that you'll notice as well that are more highly sensitive to the human condition. And they sort of go into a state of stasis where... where, where they're locked up in you know, either in the ground or, or, or some, usually in the earth or in the lower realms of the sea, for example, and in the earth, where they get locked up and basically frozen in time, which now allows for certain events to occur. And even in some cases, you could, you could have a complete nuclear holocaust on the earth and there'd be no people on, living on earth anymore. The environment would still have the potential to recover. So the, the beauty of that kind of uh, development is that, uh, that God has done, the creation that God has done, is that it, it allows for the fact that if the human condition gets so bad that certain things can no longer actually survive in a living and, and, and developmental way, they lock themselves up in that particular state and they get locked up in the earth and, the, and its atmosphere, uh, you know, in the sea and in, and, the, and, in the, and in the ground, and and they remain there now for centuries or millennia, waiting for an opportunity for a different for a different condition to to develop them. And what I feel this does is it gives um, God God by designing creatures in this way and and designing seeds and other things in that way. God allowed for humans to even go full on in their disruption, so much so that the human themselves cannot survive. But there is still a praise, a, a way that the, the environment itself can recover. Mm-hmm. So I feel that's a very important factor as well, that, that why, why God did that is very important. He, he did that to show us that we humans can take our sin to such an extent that we can destroy the environment so much that we cannot even sustain our own life. But that doesn't mean life won't be sustained. Mm-hmm. And, and we should learn from that, really, that we are in a lot of ways, human, humans are in a lot of ways, the most sensitive of creatures. Hmm. Because other creatures can survive in environments that we cannot tolerate. Yes. Yeah. And, and so we should learn from this. But, of course, not many people today are learning from things like this. Um, but we need to. And we, once, we, once we learn from that and we understand that, then we will have a lot more respect for our environment. And, in fact, we will start looking at even the most sensitive of creatures as being our measuring stick to how we are performing as, human, as humanity with regard to our care of the environment. Yes. If the most sensitive of creatures disappear then we know we are still not at the state yes. where, where we're caring for our environment properly. Mm-hmm. If sensitive creatures are disappearing, bearing in mind that humanity themselves are a very sensitive creature to the environment and, and, it's, and, and the way that it's been uh, established, we're, we're basically, by destroying the most sensitive of, of creatures or the most sensitive of plants, the most sensitive of any flora or fauna, we are basically destroying the most sensitive parts of ourselves as well. And we need to see that relationship between those two things. So I feel, I feel if you think about why, why God's provided this pristine environment, you can see there's a lot of reasons why he provided the pristine environment right at the beginning and also gave the environment enough chance to develop the most amount of diversity before humans were placed into the environment and had an impact on the environment. And to proceed if you had a question. About well, I had a question for you, uh, just for the sake of our listeners. But have you examined other planetary, uh, you know, planets that have environments that could sustain human life at this stage? 
No, no. not really. We've yeah. been very focused on the earth. Yeah, yeah. Because it's interesting. And, and also focused on our spirit life, I should oh, say. Oh, of yes. course, yeah, of course. Because it, it is interesting if you look at those environments because they have retained most of this pristine quality that has occurred, you know, through the development of, of, of you know, millen- millions of years of, of development of uh, the natural environment. And when you compare those pristine environments with the earth, that's when you get a full a concept of how far we've gone as humanity on earth, how far we've gone towards destruction. Yes. Yep. The other thing I'd like to comment about is the spirit environment. I don't know if you've noticed, but in your first sphere of the spirit environment, it's quite, you know, the upper spheres sort of mirror the Earth's condition to Mm -hmm. a degree. The lower spheres in the first sphere obviously are terribly degraded, so much so that barely anything living can survive in those environments. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the creatures that that are surviving in those kind of environments are things like cockroaches and lizards and things like that, things that can handle a large decay in the environment and still survive. Yes. And if you examine the environment in the spirit world, you can see that it goes from there, the, the full degradation of an environment, right the way through to similar to the earth condition, although in the higher part of the first sphere, it's obviously much better because you've got a, a more pristine environment that let that people do not impact upon as much. And then when you enter the second sphere and the third sphere, obviously it improves from there again and improves yeah. from there again. But you notice in the upper of the first sphere and the second and the third spheres, there's a lot of manicured environments. Yes. And I find that quite interesting because right up in the celestial heavens, in the higher spheres of the celestial heavens, there's less manicured environments. <laughs> right? But they retain beauty and wonder yes. of the natural environment that is very, very similar to the beauty and wonder that can be found on the planets that, that have no humans on them. And so do you think this, this reflection in the lower spheres is more about the still the ongoing desire for control in each of us in these, uh, control and or, or sort of self-reliant order over something? Yes. And that is why the environment reflects that. Yeah, That's it's right. It's very interesting. Yeah, so you notice that um, these manicured environments, so like in, in the celestial heavens, in the first of the celestial heavens, a lot of the environments there are... Um, still, some of them are quite manicured, but they're all for teaching lessons, <laughs> right? But as you proceed further and further through um, the celestial spheres, the, the environment becomes less and less manicured. And, and the reason why is because lessons are more refined. Mm. And for, a, for, for an environment, a manicured environment is, is, if you think about it logically, you can see that a manicured environment, it, it teaches an obvious lesson. Yes. But an unmanicured environment, an environment that's not manicured by human hands, obviously has lessons in it, but they have to be, you have to be more sensitive to them in order to understand them. So could, you, could this be related then to many of us having a feeling on earth that there was a great deal of complexity in the natural environment, but it was only us who really engaged with that more... Uh, consciously who learnt more through that engagement? Yes, but, but even then, because we had injuries emotionally, um, there was still the desire to control the environment to some extent. Oh, certainly, certainly. Right? I don't and, and even in the third sphere, there's still a desire to control the environment to some extent. Now, I know there are beautiful places in the third sphere which are more left to natural habitat, and you've probably visited those locations. Yes. But you can see there is a large proportion still of environments that are manicured. You know, they have a purpose of learning that has been directly created by other humans that have visited that location before mm-hmm. that time or have been created by God for the purpose of learning. Right? So are you saying then in the higher spheres there is more allowance of what God desires in the natural environment and, and as you say, finer lessons or more refining lessons. More refined lessons. Which require more engagement and more observation and more reflection. Is that what... And also mean? more desire to understand. Yes. Yes. And that, and that you can see why God has done yes, that. It's yes. quite obvious if you think about it's, that, isn't it? It's just incredible. Yeah. 
Perhaps one time what we could do is invite a person from the up high celestial heavens, sort of up around the 30th sphere or so to come to you and, and show you some pictures of their environments. Yeah. And, and it's interesting when a person from that place does show you those particular things because, because a lot of the times the persons who get, you know, see those images believe them to be uh, less pretty, less pristine. And, and I find that quite interesting too. When I see an environment, and this comes from this earth state still, on the earth you, quite, you, you notice it quite often how if an if a environment is manicured and managed, people think, oh, it's so pretty here and so lovely here. But if an environment is not manicured and managed but left to its own devices with encouragement, you know, like to do its natural thing, these are pristine, frequently pristine environments, but, but there's not as much attraction oftentimes by the human towards them because they don't contain this level of control that the human wants over his environment rather than an integration with his environment. So the, the upper spheres of the celestial heavens are all about integrating with the environment and becoming a part of the environment and being having the power to control the environment by understanding all of its mechanisms rather than dominating its mechanisms. Yeah. And this is an analogy, isn't it? Or, or I don't know if analogy is the correct term here, but a reflection of the similar process that happens for the soul in relation to God. Yes, yes. it's exactly the same process. And so there. really you're saying, are you saying that uh, one's, oh yes, you are, I think, one's engagement with the natural world and natural environment, wherever they may reside, is a is somehow a reflection of their engagement with God and their their relationship with God. It is, and the and the and the condition that the person is in, obviously, you know, in the very darkest of conditions, we destroy the environment to a degree that you know that that is you know terrible to see, even for the persons who are living there. You know that that's we we do that. And that's one side of not understanding the environment. But then there's this other side of not understanding the environment, and that is this desire to manicure the environment, to, to control it into being what I want it to be, rather than, rather than understanding all the mechanisms. See, uh, the, a loving person will try to assist each part of the environment to flourish, and a manicured environment doesn't support that in the long term. No. It, it, it only supports certain species flourishing and other species are not going to flourish as well. They're not going to do as well. So in the higher celestial heavens, the, the focus of the people when they're there is I want every part of this environment to flourish. And if you think about God's desire, that's what God did with the, uh, with the physical environment before humans were injected into the environment. He wanted every part to get to a point where it was flourishing before injecting humans into the environment. So obviously that's his purpose to have, his purpose is to have humans desiring every single portion of the environment to flourish. And, and this is something that I find very interesting here on earth because humans are very much against certain parts of the environment flourishing, even if they're environmentalists. <laughs> so for example, if insects flourish, Many environmentalists see that as quite bad, particularly when it has an impact on their own life, like you know, there's a plague of insects that are affecting their life, right? Then they sort of see that, oh, I need control again, right? But, but these are just demonstrate these plagues and things that happen on Earth are just demonstrating the imbalances that we've created because we are not focused on loving every portion of the environment and we have favourites. We play love-based favourites with yes. the environment. So if we look at that in, say, the third, fourth or fifth spheres or sixth spheres, where we're still developing in our love, we have control over the environment and we're still imposing our loves, the things that, you know, the types of loves we have upon the things that we want to flourish and the things that we don't want to flourish. And, and so we create a specific types of environments as a result. And to my mind, that's 
that's a second and perhaps sometimes more insidious way of destroying the environment. Yes. Because the, the first part of the destruction of the environment, where we just absolutely destroy everything, becomes very obvious very quickly that there is something wrong. There's, there's some sin as humanity that we're committing that is obviously not only against uh, the environment, but also against our own survival. Mm -hmm. But in this middle section where you create, through the management of things, you create a manicured environment, is probably what I'd like to call it, it makes you feel like everything's good, but still it doesn't get God's nature with re and God's desire with the environment. Yes, mm. yes. So there's a number of other questions uh, to ask on these topics you've been raising. Uh, there's just, it's just wonderful what you're sharing. Um, if we go back a little to the question we asked about the, the individual's relationship with their natural world mirroring their relationship with God, how does this apply to people who seem to very much have an affinity and relationship with the natural world but none with God? Or did we did we oversimplify the the um, the uh, analogy? So, certainly, because if you think about it, a, a person a person who has some affinity to creation obviously has some affinity to what to loves to 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 love. Yes. And and any person who has some affinity to love has an affinity to God, whether they believe in God or not. So that's the first thing. Frequently, where Frequently, people on earth are in a relationship with God when they do not believe themselves to be. This is and very also, frequently, they, are, they believe themselves to be when they are not. Yes. <laughs> As you would know, right? Yes. So you can see, and you can see that. Now, a person who has an affinity to the environment and desires the best for the environment and also desires the best for humanity and is also willing to act in harmony with that through the use of their time, their energy and their resources, obviously has a fairly strong affinity to God, even if they don't believe in God, because that is exactly what God wishes for them to do, and they are actually doing it. So a person like that, in some ways, has a stronger affinity to God, even if they do not believe in that God exists, than a person, let's say, who is a Christian or a Muslim or a Buddhist or some other faith, that, oh, well, you know, if you're, many Buddhists don't believe in God, a personal God, but but with some of the other faiths that do believe in a personal God, but they have no respect for the environment, no respect for, you know, caring for the environment and things like that. How much affinity to God do they really have? See, isn't it really just a, an intellectual concept or construct of God that they really have? But they're not acting in harmony with what God desires because they're not even having a relationship with God enough to know that this is what God would desire. Mm -hmm. Whereas the other persons, even if they don't understand God at all, at least know that this is a good thing to desire, this, yes. this maintain, you know, development and maintenance of a pristine environment is a good thing to desire. And so I, I would question whether a person who doesn't believe in God but who is actually very focused on caring for the earth is actually disconnected from God, as you might first assume, because... In a lot of ways, they are connected to God. They just have not yet established an actual conscious relationship mm -hmm. with God. Whereas the other people who believe themselves to have established a conscious relationship with God are not doing it. Yeah. They are, by, by destroying the environment, they are demonstrating they do not have an actual relationship with God. So this is where I see a lot of... Um, misinterpretation, I suppose you could say, of people's concepts. It's sort of like also you could say also that a person who loves truth has a stronger connection with God, even if he doesn't believe in God, mm. than a person who does not love truth has. Mm. So, so this is where I see again a contrast between many a religious faiths and, and say someone like an atheist. Many times I see an atheist and they often have a stronger connection to God in my opinion, because they care about humanity or they care about the environment a bit more or they care about the discovery of truth more, yes. when, when religions historically have attempted to 
destroy in many cases scientific discovery or scientific evidence of truth. So how much of a connection do they really have with God if that's what they're trying to do? They don't really have one. It's just a it's just an intellectual construct only. So while it is great, as you know, to eventually enter into a conscious relationship with God, you know, that, that is obviously the goal that God has here. I feel a person who cares for their environment has a much stronger relationship with those kind with God, even if they don't believe in God, than a person who has no care for the environment and claims to believe in God. Mm. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Thank mm. you. So I feel I feel that is an important thing for for people to understand. And this is where I see a lot of people judge others a lot without considering the true, you know, uh, driving motivations of the person, the actual feelings they have for things like the environment or people. You know, there's a lot of people on earth who don't believe in God, but who care a lot for people and yes. compared to other people who basically feel like, let's get rid of them all, you know. <laughs> So which one has a stronger connection with God, even if they don't believe in God in their intellect? Well, those who love as God loves. So mm. those who have a love that in some way resembles God's love for yes. people yes. would obviously have more connection. Yes. yes. It's a lovely thing. Yeah, and this is why like, in the first century I said to people that the fact that you did it to the, to the person who you viewed as the least person you could do it to and my feeling is that you could even extend that into the least of the creatures of the environment mm. means you did it to me. Mm. Like, so, you know, the, these are indicators of a true developed uh, nature, you know, that's in harmony with, like, what I would classify as good moral, ethical and loving principles. Yeah. So we could look at the, uh, if we look at the environment from that perspective, we can see that many of the people who claim to believe in God are actually responsible for the destruction of the environment to the worst degree. And so we could then say, well, if that's the case, <laughs> you know, if, if we're living in countries like in the Western countries, we consume, you know, hundreds of times more of the worst resources per, per person than people in other countries do, in the, what so-called developing countries do. How much of a love can we say we have of God when we're doing that? And how much of a love of the environment do we really have when we're doing that? And also what I notice is that very few people in Western countries actually are willing to fix an environment that has been destroyed. What they do instead is they get enough money to go to another environment that's pristine and destroy that. Mm -hmm. So this is a very interesting mentality too. It's like, let's go to an environment that's pristine, destroy it, and then go, oh, this one's not good enough for me now. <laughs> so what I'm going to do is move to another location that's lovely and pristine. And what do I do with that? Destroy that too. Mm -hmm. Now, now we've, we've got to be very careful with that kind of mentality because, because what, what, what we're really saying is that, is that when, when the environment reflects my condition, in other words, when I've destroyed it enough that I can't even tolerate it anymore, now what I'm going to do is move to another nicer environment and destroy that until I can't tolerate that anymore. Yes. And Sad. eventually we'll run out of environment if we keep doing that. Yeah. So, so at some point, people in the West in particular need to change their way, the way we use the Earth's resources, but we also need to change our desire to fix a damaged environment. So we need to be able to go to damaged environments and know and be educated about what to do to fix those environments permanently and, and spend our time doing that rather than going to pristine environments and, and unfortunately destroying them because of our condition. So I feel that's a, a big bearing on matters here on earth as well uh, in terms of what we choose to do. In the spirit world, of course, that's impossible because when you think about it, you, you're where you're living is matching, <laughs> you know, your condition. Yes. So yes. you arrive in the hells and your condition matches that. You, well, that's where you are. That's where you're going to be. And you, you can't make it worse than that except by worsening your condition. And, <laughs> and so, so you can see the direct relationship between condition and environment there. But on Earth, we go from environment to environment like an like a epidemic in a lot of ways. Uh, you know, like you could yes. say almost we're, we're, 
humanity has become the virus that destroys the earth almost mm. and and we we have the intelligence to ob obviously act differently uh, but we choose not to at this stage as a collective so there are enough resources to still do things that we can enjoy because god always provides an abundance of resources there are there are certainly an abundance of resources that we can use to have enough housing and enough food and so everything it's just the choices we make about those things are destroying the environment so again as you know looking at your comparison of environment on earth you can see that environments where there's a large consumption of meat that you know and need and we need to create an environment to support the consumption of meat those particular environments are terribly destroyed in comparison to environments where everyone's vegetarian let's say and and so and also where everyone's a vegetarian can support 10 to 100 times more people than the environment where people are eating meat so obviously the choice to eat meat is having a huge impact upon the environment and and yet what do we do we treat eating meat as a on earth generally we treat it as a you know something that proves your affluence that proves you you've made it in life you know that you, that you've you know made some uh you know developmental growth and got to the point now where you can basically destroy the earth more is <laughs> really where you've gotten to but you know we need to see it as such, for what it is and make a collective choice to do it differently because because if we do that we we can maintain we can have these environments that have food in them that still remain pristine uh, even enough food for us to live in live on live on i should say so it's it'll be very interesting getting your perspective after examining some of these other locations I'm not sure whether you'll get to those locations to examine them until you get to a certain condition. Mm. But, you know, because some of them are in a condition where they're in the sixth sphere condition. So you'd have to probably get to a sixth sphere condition or have someone from a higher sphere take you to those locations to visit them. But it would be very interesting in, in another discussion that we might have to talk to our uh, listeners about comparing the Earth environment as it is now with the pristine environment of a planet that's uninhabited and, Certainly. and comparing those particular yeah. things yeah uh may we ask some other questions yes far away so, yeah so uh, yes we observe everything that you say and we feel very much in harmony with what what you say we see the potentials on earth for for people to do things very differently but mm. obviously they are not um there are probably three remaining questions that we very much wish to ask and perhaps I can put them to you and then you can decide which ones you would like to answer and in right. which order. So the first is given that um, ha the situation that we see on Earth, uh, we feel very strongly that we would like to to do something to assist the earth environment so not just our own where we are now and not just continuing our development but we still feel an affinity or a love for what god has created on earth and and so we would love to hear your ideas and thoughts we have some ideas and thoughts about how we may uh assist people with to to make changes there there are certain spirits who are who attempt to give energy to the natural world directly but that is not what we want to do we, mm -hmm. we know that the hearts of people must change uh in order for this to be resolved so so that is our first question an additional question was given it, it has been fascinating for us to hear your um your words about the the relationship between us now and our current environment uh, and how that will change and grow as we develop in our relationship with God and move into different spheres. Mm. It, one of our initial questions at the start of our discussion was, is there, um, is there a purpose to our still feeling this care for the... Are there still things we need to or that we could learn from the earth environment uh, and our and having a relationship with the earth's natural world uh, beyond those amazing things that you have already shared with us here today 
And the third question is going back to something much earlier in our discussion, which was about you spoke about um, the diversity, the, the the diversity being established by God before humans were uh, injected into the, that environment, and then the resiliency of that diversity in in relation to human sin and how that uh, much of that diversity can be preserved. However, we do see at times that it seems that certain species are, are lost to the earth environment now. So something that God created, it's, we cannot from our current state see how it could be regenerated unless if there was to be another process of similar to that evolutionary process I mean we understand evolution is is ongoing but similar to that initial evolutionary process that happened on the earth before humans were injected uh, do you envisage such a uh, such a process having to happen and how could that occur with humans already on the earth well pr probably let's re answer the questions in reverse order because okay. I can remember your last question easier than the first <laughs> I can remember you, all three, you can remind so, me of yes, them as we go backwards yeah. But if we answer your last question first, um, the issue with regard to the the loss of species, shall we call it, the is extinction of species, yes. is an interesting issue in itself. Because as, as you know, every species that has become extinct on Earth that is uh, that has a central nervous system obviously still exists in the spirit world. Yes. But but the species that do not have central nervous systems are interesting species because they apply to the physical universe only just as a note they do appear to be the most resilient they are the most resilient and in fact if you examine the uh, species all of the species that are that do not have central nervous systems very few if, uh, and i'm I, I think i'm not even sure whether any have become extinct on the earth uh, at this stage not that we are aware of, yes. although, and we do study these things. Yes. We, well, perhaps it's more correct to say we see a, a way that they could become re-established. And we also see many species that humans don't yet even, are not even yet aware of. Correct, in correct. This, in this... Uh, in the environment itself. Yes, yeah. with these without central nervous system. Yes. So, so in this uh, classification of, of, of living creatures that really exist only in the physical universe, which which is probably the most important group of uh, species we need to look at because they are the ones that don't exist in other locations of the spirit of the world of the universe they only exist in the physical universe and because they only exist in the physical universe there there you could say theoretically there is the danger of them becoming extinct completely mm -hmm. in that they would never exist not only on earth but also wouldn't exist in the spirit world nor in the soul universes that exist either so bearing that my in mind that that is a possibility it's interesting the way god's designed them <laughs> because if you examine the design of all of them they are all so resilient that and they can go in state into stages of stasis or 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 you could say um what's another word for it that humans have a uh, i can't remember the actual scientific word for it but Di and diapausal diapausal yeah and, and and states like that for for thousands and tens of thousands of years so they can cross the boundaries of thousands of generations of people and therefore re-establish themselves and when humans go from a damaged environment that no longer really sustains human life and they move out of that environment into another environment that that particular environment is relieved of the damage and now those particular creatures can survive and benefit from the hu humans no longer being in that environment and so they have ability to reproduce and recover during that particular phase and and so the the chances of them you know from a um from a probability perspective ever becoming extinct are highly unlikely you'd have and, and even under circumstances like a complete nuclear holocaust on Earth would, would struggle to eradicate all of those particular species. So what I find very interesting about those species, and this is why those species deserve human consideration when they're on Earth, and also deserve some spirit examination 
as well, even when you're in spirit, because they are unique to this physical environment. And, and, and they create roles that in the physical environment uh, that look after a large amount of things that humans who are in a degraded condition don't want to look after themselves. <laughs> so, so, for example, humans in degraded conditions rarely look after their own garbage. But all of these species are garbage munchers, pretty much, and they look after the garbage that human, humans develop. And so I find that interesting in itself, that God's designed a system that even when we get into a state where we don't even, we're not even self-responsible enough to care for our own garbage, we've got species of, of uh, creatures that look after that garbage for us. <laughs> and, and, and to my mind, that's pretty amazing in itself, you know, that God, God didn't say, no, I'm going to make you sink in garbage now because you're not looking after your garbage <laughs> Instead, God created a, a, an environment that allows the environment to at least tidy up some of this garbage that's affecting the rest of the environment. The other thing I like about those particular creatures is that they, they provide the ability, should there be a destroyed environment, they provide the ability at, at, to be the starting point of the next evolutionary process. Mm. So, so all of them are highly resilient. All of them can handle extremes in environment all of them uh, uh, are very very difficult to destroy and as a result they can form the starting point of an evolution process if humans were no longer present again on on the earth but your question we revolved around what if humans are on the earth what yes. happens then well if humans are on the earth those particular classes of creatures the ones that with where are the central nervous system are most likely going to continue to survive and it's also highly likely that they will never um, be made extinct by human, by human choices because to make them extinct, humans would have to make themselves extinct, right? Humans would have to destroy themselves to such a degree that it can't sustain. If it can't sustain the life of an insect or, or a creature that can go into these high, you know, long periods of stasis, then humans cannot survive in those conditions. And so humans would be extinct if, if that was the case. Yeah. So at least those creatures will survive. <laughs> yes. And those plants, those kind of plants too. There's certain types of plants that, you know, sort of similar to that, and they will survive. But the ones that are more sensitive, this is the area where we've got problems because the more sensitive the creature, the more highly likely it's going to be destroyed and not be able to survive and also can be made extinct. What has God got planned for that, for that problem? Well, the way I see that is that it requires people on earth getting into a condition where they are able to recreate by knowing the genetic structure, which where they can copy from the spirit state. By knowing the genetic structure, they're able to recreate those particular animals and plants that are more highly sensitive. Now, there's nothing stopping a person on earth getting into that condition where they're able to develop to that point where they can start reintroducing species that are currently extinct. So then are you saying, so for example, if we had a situation where most of the natural creation or a very large part of it was degraded and absent, but there were still these primary creatures that you spoke of earlier. Um, as long as they exist. Yes. Would life then, is sustainable. Life is sustainable for humans. But, our but question, not very comfortable. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Our question was about um, whether evolution could be, would be engaged again. Or it sounds as though you're saying that couldn't happen because of humans' condition. But no, evolution is always engaged. Yes, I mean the process. I mean the process that occurred to create such a level of diversity as occurred yes. before humans were injected into that the process. Is still going on. It's still going on, but could it ever be achieved back to a pristine? If I could just finish, if if could that ever be achieved back to the the full level of diversity while humans exist? Um, on the earth 
Or are you, it sounds as though now you're saying that through, will it really have to occur through somebody reaching the, the condition you were speaking of and then recreating through this other process, which is somehow not, it seems as though the initial evolution happened without human intervention, so without human degradation or support, but it sounds as though you're saying now, if a human were to reach a certain level of uh, development, then they could support that evolutionary process back to the pre-established diversity. That's right. So, 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 so if, we, if we look at it logically, if the human condition is lower than a six-sphere condition, the perfect natural man's condition, so any, in other words, a human condition is anything like in the fifth sphere, fourth sphere, third sphere, second sphere, first sphere, in those kind of conditions, then actually the humans are contributing to the degradation of the environment, aren't they? In yes, that state. yes, yes. So we're still contributing to the degradation of the environment, even if we're in the third sphere living on Earth, we're still contributing to the degradation of the environment. The reason why we are is because our condition doesn't match the pristine condition that God created the original environment in. And so therefore, we are contributing to its degradation. Mm. But once we got to a six-sphere condition, we're no longer contributing to the degradation of the environment. Now, in a six-sphere condition, let's assume all humanity was in the six-sphere condition, but all there was on the earth was just stuff that could just barely sustain life. Yes. Given enough time, if all of us stay in a six-sphere condition, Yes. And when I say enough time, it's going to have to be the original millions of years. Wow. Yes. <laughs> we can re-establish everything. Everything can come back through uh -huh. through the evolutionary process. So as long as so I see I see now it's because there was the free will influence on the six sphere condition that God waited until the diversity was originally established. Yeah. Otherwise there was the risk of humans lessening from the six sphere condition before that diversity was fully established and negatively impacting on the process. That's right. I yeah. see. So when the first human couple arrived, for instance, here on this earth, the, the, the establishment of the condition was such that the environment was pristine at a six sphere condition. And therefore, and therefore, the humans were placed on the environment in a six sphere condition. Mm -hmm. In that moment, placing the humans in the environment, the, the environment itself was not destroyed right at that moment. Human choice is what caused the destruction of the environment. Now, if you think about it, given enough time, if we were in a six sphere condition mm -hmm. and all humanity would need to be in a six sphere yes. condition for this to occur, and there were just a, a very uh, fundamental environment on the planet. Yes. Given enough time, millions of years, mm -hmm. and potentially maybe billions of years, we would get to the point where all of the original creatures that existed here would exist again. Right? We, we would love for that day. <laughs> well, that's a very, it's going to be a very slow process, that one, obviously. Um, what I'm suggesting is this alternative. Yes. The alternative is... That, that some people get into a better condition than a six fear condition mm. and are able to create the creatures that were used to be in the environment mm. but are now not in the environment. And also they will more easily support and more rapidly support the evolution mm -hmm. of those creatures as well, being in a higher condition. Mm -hmm. And that will result in their potential of being able to create creatures that are no longer here on earth mm. but are... But in the end, it's all just genetic code mm -hmm. with the life force from God injected into it. Mm -hmm. So as you know, in the spirit world, you can create a, a living plant. You can, and probably you've, each of you have probably done this by now. Yes. Yeah. Created a living plant of your own design and asked for God to inject it with the life force. And it's become a living plant mm -hmm. that has grown into a tree or whatever. Now, there's nothing stopping that from occurring on Earth as long as the spiritual environment on the Earth is such that everyone knows that it's able to be done. Because it, there's, there's spiritual constraints uh, based upon the way God uh, asks us to develop our morality that uh, have impact upon our ability to do that currently. Mm -hmm. But in the future, 
when everybody realizes that this thing, this can be done. It's like when everybody realizes that spirits could be materializing every moment on earth, then spirits will materialize every moment on earth and still interact mm -hmm. and then go to where they were and back and forth all the time. Mm -hmm. That's what will happen. But everybody has to get in the moral condition where they accept these things are possible and, and have the faith that these things are possible in order for that to occur. But individuals will get into that condition over time. And once those individuals are in that condition, they have the ability to reintroduce species by just copying the genetic code that was still available in the spirit state into the physical state and asking God to inject that creature with life. And though that way, a lot of the things that have become extinct over the duration of humanity's destruction can actually be re-established much more quickly mm -hmm. than the evolutionary process would allow. And do you think God would place any restriction on the capacity for such a person to do that based on the condition of others in their environment? Certainly, because, because this, like I said, it depends a lot upon the persons in the environment and their desire to re-destroy those particular things. As you know, God doesn't do anything without economy and function. So if a person reintroduced a species that was sensitive only to find out that the environment doesn't support the species and it dies again, there is little point to that process. Yes. Obviously, humanity needs to get to a point where we're able to create an environment collectively where we want a species, uh, one of these species to return. And then a person who's in that condition can reintroduce the species without there being a further destruction of the species to the point of ex extinction again. Mm -hmm. and, and so naturally God's not going to just, you know, allow the creation of a species only to find that within a few years that exact same species is now extinct again because humans haven't done enough work to actually establish the environment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm. This is wonderful. So yeah. you can see that it's, uh, one of the things you ask, uh, I think the second question you ask is what you can do as spirits to assist this process of recovery on earth. Yes. And as you know, um, well, I, I sort of believe there are physical and, and as you know, spiritual things that can be done. If we examine the spiritual things firstly, obviously the condition of people is the main determining factor of the structure of the environment. Yes. So obviously anything we can do to help people change their attitudes and their minds about things that are, that are collectively destroying the environment on a large scale the you know the more that can be done there as a spirit the more you know you, you obviously want to do it and that that will obviously help the environment re-establish itself if the humans are in a position where they want to recover the environment then we can take do work to recover it so as you've seen from our own work here that we've done on our environment you can see by establishing the basic fundamentals in the environment and my desire to establish those fundamentals, the, there are a lot more creatures now can survive. And a lot of those creatures that are in stasis or have been in diapausal and those kind of creatures have now started to live again. And so many of them I've never seen my entire life and I don't think they've even been here in Australia for, for many years. And yet, and yet they've reappeared in our environment in certain locations. And that's an indication that as your condition grows and also as your, as your desire to re-establish the environment grows, obviously things can change. So, so what can we do from <clears throat> our location here to help that uh, change in desire? I mean, many of us impress upon people the beauty <laughs> that, uh, that is possible or that is in front of a person but we're very conscious of issues of free will and um, not negatively influencing or, or what we would now call negative influence. Yeah, obviously you can impress upon a person um, positive images about what their future can be. That is one way to motivate desire, isn't it? Yes. And, and obviously as a spirit you can easily do that given the circumstances of the individual if they as soon as they you know have some well some interaction with the environment you can impress upon them what the environment could have looked like or what it could look like and these kind of things and their their desire for such a thing to grow will grow then 
But there is this other, I suppose you could say, negative aspect of the sin of humans mm. and how that impacts upon the environment that needs to be addressed. And I know that as a spirit it's very difficult to address that because many times the person themselves doesn't feel inclined to, um, to come face to face with the, the negative aspects of the choices they're making. Most of the time they want to hear a good story but they don't want to see the bad story. Mm. I feel the key as a spirit is to try to impress upon them both stories. Mm. So when they see a, an environment that is not pristine, or they are in an environment, even in their own backyard, and they're doing something that is not pristine, to impress upon them that actually you're contributing to the destruction of this environment now. Mm. And, you know, when they're using things like pesticides, herbicides, when they're when they're doing uh, large scale, or even, you know, creation of new technologies that, you know, that are plastics that are going to be difficult to destroy or things like that, that you know, we impress upon those particular people doing those particular things that this is going to be very hard to destroy this now that you've created this. And I feel this kind of impression also needs to be given to people. It's the same as a person just walking up to another person in the street, really, isn't it, and saying, look, you just threw out your rubbish and don't you think you should pick it up? <laughs> you yes. know, that kind yes. of thing. Yeah. And, and while the person might get angry and upset about the impression, at the end of the day, you know, it still needs to really be said mm -hmm. to the person. And, uh, and I feel that can be done too. So, so, you know, in terms of impressing them. Obviously, the best way to help them is to help them grow spiritually and to have a connection with God via the conscience about what they're doing. You want a person's conscience to be activated in such a way that their conscience bothers them when they take an action that harms the environment, mm -hmm. rather than them seeing that uh, some kind of harm in the environment doesn't matter, mm -hmm. right? and, and something that they shouldn't need to care about. And, and you know, this kind of development is more difficult to achieve, as you, as you know, you know, impressing people to make that kind of change is difficult. But at least if you can help them connect to the conscience and, and feel the effect of their conscience when they take an action, mm -hmm. that will help them greatly to, even though it may upset them, it will help them greatly to go, okay, yeah, I'm, I'm bothered by what I just did. Mm -hmm. You know, I threw out that rubbish out the window. I just developed a new plastic and it's going to be very hard to destroy. I've developed this product that while, you know, uh, like I see a lot of toys that for children, you know, that contribute to large amounts of plastic on the planet. Things like bottling water in plastic and things like that, obviously contributing large amounts of destruction on the planet just for the sake of making money really out of water, mm -hmm. out of an essential resource. And these kind of things, the people who conceive these kind of things need to be influenced <laughs> Mm. to, to f listen to the promptings of their conscience mm -hmm. so that they no longer make those kind of decisions. There are some physical things that can be done too, of course, and, and they, those things include helping, helping certain plants, animals and everything stay in diapausal or stay in stasis when rather than take instant opportunities to get out of stasis that are not going to be long, give, long enough life to enable reproduction. So, for example, there are things that we can do to the physical environment as a spirit that, that would prevent a, if you could predict the weather a little bit, as we can as a spirit, you can see, well, I, you know, this particular event is a big rain event today, but the next, you know, 10, 12 weeks are going to be completely dead. And most of these creatures are not going to be able to reproduce. And we're going to end up with a smaller bank of animals or plants or in stasis or diapausal. And if under those circumstances, you're better off trying to stop them from, from if they have, you know, are able to be stopped, stop them from having going into those into the living phase of their life and stay in that phase for a bit longer until the conditions are better. So really, you're saying to to somehow counteract or to counteract the way that um, the innate wisdom or instinct of that uh, animal or plant has been interfered with By the through human, condition. human condition and influence. So mm. we use our influence upon the natural environment simply to counteract 
the unpredictability or the changes that um, that those those creatures and creations would have been quite sensitive to when the the moment is exactly right. But Correct. Because there has been this yes, degradation of the environment. Yes. yes. If it, if we help our listeners understand that a bit better, because my my words probably didn't help them understand that. But it, the way that a lot of these systems are developed from God's perspective, where that when the environment is perfect, the creature would would uh, would come into a to a state of life, shall we call it, or out of the state of stasis into a state of life, and reproduce, and and the whole cycle would then be, of course, replicated. Now, under pristine conditions, that's happening all the time. There's no mass on flat on flux of that. So, and that's why in a pristine in a pristine environment, everything is in balance because no creature goes overboard with reproduction anymore because it doesn't need to. It, it's it, it, it's assured of its own survival through the natural processes. It doesn't need to have an overwhelming presence in that moment it, because it, in a natural environment, it would have all just nice and evenly naturally flowed. There'd be abundance of everything. In a, in a damaged environment, there are times when the damaged environment supports a large amount of life, and there's times when the damaged environment for, supports a very, very low amount of life. And those times cycle. So during weather cycles and so forth, these things cycle. So what these animals have learnt to do over this process is they've learnt to, whenever there's a cycle where there's a potentially support a large amount of life, all of them go out of stasis <laughs> and into reproduction. This, of course, causes, uh, in some cases, causes even more damage to the environment because some of these animals and, so, and plants, and particularly insects, need the food now to survive, and so they eat everything in their path until they die, and then they go back in stasis again. And this imbalance has been caused by humanity's destruction of the environment. Now, if, if we control that to a degree as a spirit, and there are many spirits, as you probably know, even doing that already, then it controls the amount of destruction to the environment that is happening in any one moment. Mm -hmm. And therefore, the environment has a better ability to recover potentially with that assistance. Yep. Mm, but yes, and we know. without the humans changing on Earth, <laughs> obviously there's, you know, you can do that, but it's not going to have a large effect, the largest effect. Yeah. We also notice that some things that um, the the creation has uh, a sort of innate instinct of what would precede what and what would follow what in terms of its triggers for germination or yes. uh, reproduction. And very often because sadly now we see so much human intervention to either create those conditions or delay those conditions or alter those conditions, both in terms of climate change, but also in terms of the way that people try to um, replicate, for example, the, the um, conditions for germination in a very artificial way. And then, but then the the existing plant in this example, it may be an insect or even an animal, doesn't have the corresponding environment it would usually associate, even though it doesn't have a mind, but in that instinct built in. This is the mis this, this miracle of what we observe. Yes. The way that um, a creation has a sense of when it is right, and yet now we see so many things going wrong because humans have intervened and rain doesn't come when it would usually follow after or uh, the the um, seed germinates in a lovely nursery but then is placed into a very <laughs> arid condition and yeah. must be, it may even be watered, but the other environment that the seed anticipated is in terms of the air and mm. the uh, humidity is not there. And so we see many of these things, and I've given you just a tiny, tiny example of what we observe, a myriad of things where human influence impacts upon that innate wisdom, we like to call it, within the creation. And this then means that things are really struggling. 
Yes. Yes, and that. And but you're saying it's it's appropriate for us to intervene, and and that is wonderful news. Yes, it's appropriate to intervene. Um, obviously, with the knowledge that without humans on Earth who have the greatest effect on these particular things changing in their condition, um, the intervention, while it can be localized uh, in certain locale areas, it's not going to be global. Yes. Because and it because of the way humanity is constructed, the environment. And that is why we saw so much the um, the imperative to somehow act upon the hearts of, yes. of humans. Yes, and, and and at this stage, it feels to me like the only way. Uh, most, as you know, most people's hearts is quite are quite hard to what they do in their life. Most people on Earth are driven by money alone or by financial security alone, and that's even now happening in developing countries as well as developed countries. And so there's very, there's very little softness to what destruction and damage is being done to the environment. And, and the way to begin the process of softness is to trigger the conscience, mm. <laughs> you know, the help a person feel some level of, uh, you know, connectedness with the truth of what they're doing and the guilt associated with doing it in a, in a, um, in a way that's damaging. And you know, that, that, that is one of the few, aside from inspiring them about some possibilities, that is one of the few ways you can really help a person who's hardened their heart to such an extent that they're willing to destroy their own environment to the point where they can't even sustain their own life anymore. So it, it feels to me that you've got to sort of begin at this sort of fundamental level of helping people connect with what is the truth of the matter here what is the truth about my survival and the survival of my children and the survival of my grandchildren? What is, where are we headed with this? That's where we need to focus a lot of energy, I think, emotionally, you know, as spirits onto the earth, because, because it, without people making those kind of changes, it's going to be very, very difficult for them to, to make the actual change into understanding the mechanisms involved in, the, in nature itself mm. as to how, you know, as to why we have things like plagues and famines mm -hmm. and or why we have you know abundance and famine you know why these particular cycles are occurring very much about what humans have done to the environment yeah mm. Mm. thank you and did that answer the every i think the there first was question was one answer, more was question yeah. um which <laughs> Well, we feel almost through this discussion, we have learned that there is far more that we can continue to learn by observing the Earth's example and observing the natural world on Earth because mm. there, you've helped us to really understand how much um, there there is a... It seems like more possibilities in the Earth natural environment then here our environment our natural environment naturally reflects our condition and mm -hmm. as we continue to change our condition so too does our environment much to our delight uh, but it sounds as though in the uh, earth environment there's far more factors and so there is much more we can continue to learn not just about um Hum humans and our own selves but about God through mm. observing those processes. We just had some concerns uh, upon hearing your previous discussion that perhaps we were still too engrossed in the earth uh, environment uh, and had some some tie there that was inappropriate and we're still open to hearing from you about that. If, if well, that that's probably case. where I'd like to take you back to the discussion about a manicured environment or a, a controlled environment as you know um one of the main you know one thing one of the main things we learn on god's way is to learn how to control through a lack of control if that's the best <laughs> way of putting it and um, it's not through the soul rather than action well yeah, yeah. I, yes. I, more thinking about it, it being a that the way God's designed the emotional process, if you consider the emotional process, is that you have to really, truly uh, experience the sincere feeling, don't you, mm -hmm. in order to move through the emotion. And any other thing other than that is really controlling the emotion. Yes. Right? If you think of the environment in the same way, um, you can see why the third sphere environment is, is very, very different to, say, the 30th 
sphere environment. The third sphere environment reflects the desire for control of emotion. The okay. third sphere environment reflects the desire to live in harmony with the universe with regard to emotion. Yes. Which is which which is true control. Mm -hmm. Right, it's not in the first sphere. There's the illusion of control mm -hmm. of the environment. You you believe that you're able to control the environment, but it, but in in reality, the environment is just reflecting your control of it. It's 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 so it's not full control environment because not everything in the environment can flourish. Yes, only certain things can flourish, and and yet say in the third sphere or in the thirty fifth sphere, in the highest sphere of the of the physical. Uh, you know the spirit physical realm in that sphere everything can flourish into the same degree as a human can flourish mm -hmm. even though everything else is not doesn't have free will the free will of the human determines how everything else flourishes and therefore the free will of the human exercised in harmony of love really determines the outcome of for the environment Yes. Whereas, in, and in the third sphere, that's happening, of course, but the level of control that the person feels over their state emotionally, and it's, and and remember, control over the state emotionally is not just control over the emotion that has been harmful; it's also control over the emotion that is a part of your nature, mm -hmm. your personality, your desires, your passions, and this is why the eighth sphere state environment is diff very different to the 35th sphere state environment mm -hmm. because the 8th sphere state environment there's still controls or lacks of discovery about nature and personality yes. that are yet to be for formulated in the person's self-discovery mm -hmm. but in the 35th sphere environment that's almost complete mm. and so therefore the the per the environment now can everything in the environment can in the 35th fifth sphere can accurately reflect the state where the soul isn't almost complete. And, and so it feels to me too, we need to, uh, in the lower spheres, understand that while I maintain an attempt to control my development, mm -hmm. I am basically maintaining an attempt to control things in my environment as well. Yes. And that applies even after I become at one with God. Because in the eight sphere state, you're still, because of the lack of discovery, still controlling things that you haven't discovered yet. Yes, I understand. Yeah. Yes. So, so if you bear that in mind, that also applies to your third sphere state, doesn't it? Like if yes. you think about it, you can go, well, wow, how much of my third sphere environment, my, my, you know, my natural environment, is actually reflecting my lack of desire to grow not just by releasing my negative uh, emotional condition, my unloving emotional condition or releasing my sin, but how much could it grow if I embraced my desires? How much could it grow if I embraced my passions? How much could it grow if I actually become more of myself? Mm -hmm. Right. This is very, yeah. we're very moved by what you're saying here and I feel myself some stirrings of sadness but also... Um, uh, desire for for this more challenge. This uh... well, if we go back to your original statements when you introduced yourself, yes, and how you were saying how um, you know, during that period of life from the seventeen hundreds to recently, how you were sort of a you you were connected to the environment, connected to God, but still very reticent to develop mm -hmm. uh, positive traits or aspects of yourself. Yes. You can see how that has impacted on your on the environment itself, and 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 that is an impact of its own yes. on the environment. It's like it's like you know. I suppose the average person on earth might relate to it. Like if you play heavy metal music to a tomato, <laughs> and you pl or you play you know classical music to a tomato. Yes. What happens to the tomato? <laughs> yes. You know, so you're saying I. I didn't take the opportunity to play, in that analogy, play the classical music. Yeah, you chose to not play the heavy metal, which is great. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, mm -hmm. but when it came to playing the classical, well, you chose to not do that either, mm -hmm. to a degree. And this is where um, I feel 
developing passionate desires for things can greatly enhance the environmental experience as well as the experience of your personal life and your relationships and every other aspect of your existence, obviously. Yeah. Thank you. But in relation to our fascination for the earth environment, you don't see that as in your previous uh, person who you, who you spoke with, uh, your previous interviewer, they had some issues with not letting go of the earth and you don't feel that so much in us? Or Well, if you discuss, have you had the opportunity to discuss this matter with celestial spirits? Well, no, it just, it literally just came up as we were as observing we were so we yeah. can, please, we don't need to take more of your time. We can certainly... Well, no, no, what I'm that. suggesting is this, is that if you discuss this matter with celestial spirits, you will find that they are passionately, in, like, interested in the earth environment, mm. but not for personal reasons. Yes. Uh, it's more for the sake of assisting the earth environment to develop and grow and also assisting the people on the environment to grow and develop, isn't it? Yes, and that we feel that is our yeah. deep desire. Yes. So when a person, remember the spirit who came, Stephen, earlier, who came to us, and um, he came, he was mostly interested or driven by his sadness yes. about his family and what was happening with his children in particular and his inability now to carry on a relationship with them. Um, or that it was his belief mm -hmm. is the best way to put it. And he had little concern for anything other than that. Mm -hmm. right? So his interest in the earth wasn't driven by a desire that was pure, but rather by an addiction that he had to, that he wanted satisfied. Mm -hmm. And even in my conversation with him, he, you know, obviously at times wanted to leave mm -hmm. because he, he really wanted the conversation to be more about himself mm -hmm. than, than about the issues he faced. Mm -hmm. And and that in itself is also evidence of the lack of sincerity of the interest in the earth. Mm. It's, not, it's, not, it's not for the earth's sake, it's for like his sake. Mm -hmm. Now you know that all the 14 have come back to the earth because we're ex very interested in the earth. Uh -huh, that is true, right? so we need not be... So every yes. person who um, loves is going to be very, very interested in the earth for a lot of reasons. And, and one of the primary reasons is that, that the earth is the place where people are conceived mm. and therefore the place where their individualization begins. Therefore, the place that can have the largest positive or negative impact upon them. Mm -hmm. And so any person who truly loves is going to be interested in attempting to assist the earth environment physically as well as spiritually, mm -hmm. to grow because that is the environment where either damage or a, a great start can be made. Mm -hmm. And so my, my feelings are there's no harm. In fact, I think any person who's connected with God will be very interested in the earth environment, but not for personal reasons, not for yeah. selfish reasons. That's kind of that's the key, isn't it? Right. There are many spirits, uh, even in the sixth sphere, who are still interested in the earth, but only for selfish reasons. Mm. You know, only because they want something that they believe in to be made known on earth, or only because they want, you know, some philosophy they've come up with with life to be known on the earth, or because they want to create a religion. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, that often happens too. You know, but is that really an interest in the earth, or is it an interest in their own? Uh, you know, pride or mm. aggrandizement, I suppose you call it, their own welfare. Mm -hmm. um, this is what any sincere spirit would need to consider with their interest on the earth. So I feel there's no harm. And in fact, there's a great deal of benefit that can be gotten from your interest on earth, notwithstanding the fact that your interest on earth can also benefit you, but that wouldn't be your primary driving factor. Of course, it would be it, 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 you, it, when you're driven purely, as you know, naturally each person involved in every interaction benefits yeah thank you so much <laughs> thank you so much for mm. this time and that was an enjoyable conversation it, yes we, very we much. got to talk there about a lot of things i haven't talked about on earth already so yes. i'm sure that many of our listeners will be a bit surprised about some of that information i hope um, so yeah. there was some 
there were some points where we felt we we understood but we could tell that you were we wanted this to be a benefit to a as many people as possible yes, and yes, so yes. Uh, to, to, to have you explain many things is, yeah. is just wonderful and yeah. thank and you so for, so much and thank for you doing everyone who made it possible that we could do this today yeah, yeah. yes and thank and, you and, and also thanks for um like tolerating my discussion when i know that you already know the answers to some things but but um sometimes like sometimes because you know and you know what i'm saying Oftentimes our audience doesn't know what I'm saying and sometimes you yes. have to sort of be a bit more careful about, you know, making sure that it's clearer. Yes, yeah. we understand mm. and, and mm. really um, there, if, if one is sincere and really listens, there's often many other things that we amongst us were reminded to not assume we understand everything. We understand some things but... Then there were other points that you raised, and, and that you've, had, you've had a great opportunity. Caused us to think further. Yeah, yes. yeah. You've had a great opportunity, haven't you, already to examine natural events on the earth, specifically and, this. Yes, and so you know, there's already a great deal of knowledge that you have in that regard. But um, this whole cycle that I see, you know, people go through, which is this cycle of, you know having a terribly damaged environment um, into a manicured environment and then into what God classifies as a <laughs> pristine environment, which is very, very different than what the person who has a manicured environment thinks a mm -hmm. uh, pristine environment is. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so it's it's interesting to have that discussion too. And, and I'm sure that some of our friends from some of those spheres can come now that you have a knowledge you can ask some of those questions and be conscious of those things they can come and and give you some ideas and concepts about those environments too okay. and and what I uh, probably in closing what I'd like to say is this the earth environment in its pristine state is very similar in a lot of ways to the way a 35th sphere environment is particularly if you take humanity out of it because because it's allowed to do its own thing mm. uh, with all of its codependency and and all of its uh, what do they call it Co um, where all the relationships between nature are cooperative and mm -hmm. all of those things are all all going on in that pristine state you know in, in that regard like when I go and you'll notice this in your travels with me sometimes when I go to a state where I feel is more pristine even though it's not manicured, it feels better to me, mm -hmm. you know. And you can see on our property here, what we're trying to create is not a manicured environment, but a pristine environment, mm -hmm. a very different environment that's going to support all life. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so, yeah, I just feel that, you know, that that is the possibility we have here on Earth. And and also the possibility, interestingly enough, the the first to the fifth spheres won't even exist when that possibility is reality. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a part, it, I find that interesting that it's a part of rolling up the heavens mm. because the, the third, fourth, fifth and the second and first spheres only exist because those environments had to be created in order to support the condition of the people mm -hmm. in those conditions. And, and, it, it, and yet the natural environment on the earth was needed. That's right. Yes. That's right. Yes. Yeah. 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 And really, if you think about it, the natural environment in the spirit world would obviously also be a six sphere environment, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. wouldn't it? Yes. And there would no, be no third, fifth sphere, fourth sphere, third sphere, second mm -hmm. sphere, first sphere. Mm -hmm. Would be no need for those environments. Mm -hmm. They would all disappear, mm -hmm. actually. If nobody needed to live in them anymore, they wouldn't need to be there. Mm -hmm. So. So that's an interesting concept as well, that Very much. a part of the rolling up of the heavens is also this question of how we look after the environment. Yes. Yeah. Fascinating. Mm. And there's many things that we have observed in the first, second and third sphere in the workings of the natural environment that one day we would love to speak Share. with you about. Yeah, but that'd be great. Not today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what, what we might do at some point is when we do some environmental work or whatever, it'd be good to have somebody come and... and we just question you mm -hmm. about 
the things that go on in the natural environment mm -hmm. in the different spheres you've already visited because I think that'll give people a bit of an idea of the possibilities of their life in the spirit world. As you know from our previous discussion, like a lot of people believe that there's limited possibilities after they pass. Mm. I know, you know, my own father in this life, he basically believes he's got to get everything done as fast as he can do it and do as much as he can do now because when he's dead, he's dead is the way he sees it. And, and that's a sad way of seeing life because you, you end up destroying the environment to a large degree not realizing that actually you're also stopping yourself from entering pristine environments in the spirit world with that attitude mm. yeah mm. so it's been good having the discussion with you about it i'm sure people will gain some benefit from the discussion too we hope so yeah, yeah. yeah. thank you again yeah thanks for coming natalia good to good to have met you and uh and thanks for tolerating my long-winded explanations <laughs> <laughs> We appreciate your time very much. No worries. <laughs> we'll catch you later. Bye. It was good, babe. How did you feel? Yeah, that no, was a good yeah, conversation. Good conversation. Gave an opportunity to discuss a lot of things we've never mentioned before. And yeah. That's what I like about conversations like that is that, you know, it's, you're discussing things that are different to what's been discussed before and not something that most people on earth would ever really ask about you know yeah, yeah. they're too engrossed in it. too engrossed in their own pain and suffering yes. and, yeah and yeah. seeing engagement you yeah. know to, to <laughs> ask questions about things like that you know yeah, yeah. she was a pleasure to channel she mm. was very feel, felt very soft and gentle like, mm. 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 yeah all right, everyone, we'd like to thank you for your time. That was a fairly long channeling. Hopefully you enjoyed that. About uh, I don't know what we'll call that. It'll probably be called environmental <laughs> uh, whatever. I'm not They'll sure know yet. by now. <laughs> um, you, you'll know by when you see it. But uh, it's been lovely to have the, have the conversation together with our spirit friends, and Natalia and the group she had there. And, uh, and also we'd like to thank you for your time, for listening, and we'll look forward to seeing you next time. <laughs> see you later. See you later. <laughs>